I'll just introduce um, Ms. Seema Parakat. So she's a seasoned professional with over 11 years of experience in the fields of product management, business development, entrepreneurship, stakeholder management, and international test, prep, um, test preparation. Um, at GMSE, she's the state manager of outreach, and she handles, you know, the Pan-Asia region for both GMAT and NMAT, right? Um, and in today's session, we'll mainly have a GMAT Focus edition Q&A. So Ms. Seema will first introduce the GMAT Focus, the changes in content, when it will come out, how the scoring, the scoring percentiles will differ, so on and so forth, and any other relevant updates. So this is a great opportunity for you guys to hear directly from somebody high up at the GMSE and directly from the company that prepares the test, right? So... A fantastic opportunity. And once Ms. Seema presents her, you know, complete PPT on GMAT Focus, then we will also have a Q&A in which you guys can directly ask the questions that you have all been indirectly asking me or pondering about on the groups or maybe visited GMAT Club to get more insights. Key, how will the percentiles differ? Will quant become more difficult, for example? Um, will verbal become less important? Will it be a bit like the CAT or the Indian version of the CAT exam? All those queries that we have had, right? So over to you, Seema. So I will let you share your presentation, right? Um, and then, you know, you can take it over from there. So thank you for the lovely introduction. Just give me a Maybe. second. I'll just share my screen. Sure. Yep. Can you see that? Yes. Yes, I can see the screen. So, guys, if you could just quickly confirm again for Ms. Seema that the PPT is visible and that she is audible as well. Yep. So, I think we are good to go. Seema. Yeah, I can so, see see the messages coming in. So, um, before I actually start, um, you know, first of all, uh, you've already introduced as to what I'll be covering right now. So, I do want to make the session as uh, interactive as I can. So, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I'll be quickly taking you through the deck, uh, and, you know, I want you guys to actually note down the questions, whatever comes to your mind. There is no question which is silly or otherwise. Please make sure you clear all the doubts that you have. Um, so, you know, once we, we are done with that, like, if you want to reach out later as well, you know, I'll drop in my email ID at the end of it, so you can do that as well. So let's mm -hmm. let's start with this one. Uh, one more question that I want to ask you guys is, how many of you are actually preparing for the GMAT exam right now? If you could just like drop in the chat. You know, if you're preparing, you can simply write it as preparing. And if you are actually considering your options, you can say considering, or considering your preparation or your schedule. Okay. Okay, once. Okay, okay. All right. And how many of you are actually applying for round 2024, like the round one of 2024? Round one or round two of 2024? Okay. Okay. Great. Okay. Uh, keep the, uh, you know, responses coming in. So let's get this started. The first thing that I would actually like to address is... Uh, who exactly is the GMAC? One of the biggest, um, you know, all the interesting factors that I've actually noticed while interacting with candidates over such kind of sessions is that everybody knows the GMAT, but nobody knows where it actually comes from, you know. So whenever I say that I'm from GMAT, everybody's like, what's that? So Graduate Management Admission Council was actually founded in 1953 by uh, an association of schools. And we own and administer the GMAT exam, of course. And we also have other assessments like the NMAT and the executive assessments. NMAT is used in India and East Asia, as well as um, at some of the African countries for the management programs, right? And executive uh, assessment is used for the executive MBA programs globally. Uh, we also do have a lot of resources that you can explore that will help you on this you know, journey that you have set out on with respect to management education. Um, if you are from a STEM background and you want to strengthen your background uh, in business and showcase to the schools that you're applying to as well, you can check out the business fundamentals, you have operations, statistics, finance, and, you know, the important subjects of so the foundations covered there. 
and the schools can also be let know that you you know this is a very valid uh, proof of your knowledge in these areas um there's also the great select option of the gmas wherein you can register for it and allow the schools to um you know discover you as well as you to actually uh, discover different schools that align to your requirement plus the skill insights option wherein you have video lessons and you know a uh, game center which you can use to practice your questions and uh, i do want to make a special mention of our uh, gmac course coming up as well or previously known as the mba tour where you will get to meet uh, various uh, business schools in person also across various centers this all of this information will be available on mba.com so i mean the the whole point of the association or the gmac you know it being created was to make sure that each of you who have got very unique capabilities and potential your talent does not go undiscovered because of lack of opportunities so gmax job and gmax responsibility is to make sure that you have access to the right kind of information and tools for you and the schools to discover each other and you know find the right fit for a highest quality business education so having that out of the way so it is without a doubt that you know gmat exam is the number one exam for graduate business school um, education now how do i say that well i have numbers to kind of like prove it in terms of acceptance uh, let me be very clear more than 7700 programs which is the highest uh, any assessment is used globally for graduate management education across 2400 universities and organizations in over 110 countries use the gmat exam for their selection criteria for the admissions right and every year more than 200000 candidates actually write the exam and 9 out of 10 of those candidates use gmat for their uh, mba enrollments you will find that most of the business schools if you look at the percentage of admits within a classroom um you can look up 2022 2023 the the number of candidates admitted to the program are you know the it's the percentage of candidates admitted to the program you see gmat is higher in the mix of the classroom right and you will find that 7 in 10 applicants actually use uh, the gmat exam while applying to the 100 ranked mba programs as well so a lot of numbers that i'm actually throwing at you but the idea is that when you are thinking graduate management education um yeah it's it's just safe to say that you think gmat now one more thing i want to address before i actually move on to you know focus is that uh, in terms of validity gmat is actually a aicte ratified exam it's one of the six ratified exams by the aicte uh, you know for the for the full time uh, pgp programs you'll find it alongside cat um, these at and you know mat all of those exams so it's very valid for application into you know full time mba programs in india as well or indian business schools as well so your options are pretty broad when it comes to gmat um so you know gmat has been a gold standard since its inception or since its administration in uh, 1953 it has consistently undergone a lot of changes like you know there's been uh, introduction of analytical writing and assessment there has been an introduction of integrated reasoning changes in the registration policies uh, obviously the updation and the introduction of the online exam when the covid hit so the change has been continuous in order to ensure that it continues to remain the gold standard right and with the changing times and with you know you have certain requirements in terms of the way the world has moved forward the there is you know there are certain skill sets that both employers as well as business schools actually look at in terms of what you know when a when a particular candidate comes in uh, from a management education or towards a management education keeping all of this in mind including your prep time and the kind of uh, life that you lead uh, the the focus addition has been brought into the picture and let me tell you that this has been done after a lot of research um there is nothing that gmat actually does out of the blue 
uh, a lot of work effort has gone into it a lot of conversations with the business schools a lot of testing um, and interaction in order to ensure that the right kind of you know product actually comes through right so in a sense with all of these considerations the new form of the exam is going to be shorter so that means from 3 hours 7 minutes it's moving down to 2 hours 15 minutes which is like 1 hour shorter right it's going to be more efficient especially in terms of the prepping experience as well as the test taking experience um it's going to be more flexible uh, if you see the score sending options again the test taking uh, environment that you will be facing or the experience you'll be facing it's going to get more flexible for you and lastly insightful with the scores including more performance insights you're going to find that it's only adding on to the advantages that you get along with your registration right so we're going to see that all of these in detail further but before doing that let me address how does the structure of the focus edition actually change with respect to the current version of the exam so i i've seen that a lot of you have mentioned that you are actually preparing for the exam and some of you are actually considering so i'm i'm still going to go through the four sections in the current version you have the quantitative reasoning section with 31 questions and you know to be answered in 62 minutes 6 to 51 is the score range you have the verbal reasoning section 36 questions to be answered in 65 minutes score range of 6 to 51 and you have your integrated reasoning 12 questions in 30 minutes where you know 1 to 8 score range is not a part of your total score of 200 to 800 but you'll find that the business school still do consider this for the admission process and then last you have your analytical writing with one task which, which is an essay um ranging score ranging from 0 to 6 to be covered in 30 minutes uh, the argument that same part now argument is a again not a part of your 200 to 800 score right if you look at the quantitative reasoning you'll find that you have two question types which is a problem solving and data sufficiency in verbal you have critical reasoning reading comprehension and sentence correction um uh, we'll get to the integrated reasoning bit later if you look at the focus edition you can see that there are just three sections right and once more if you look at if you look carefully you will find that the score range for each is 60 to 90 and uh, each section duration is 45 minutes your two familiar sections are the quantitative reasoning section and the verbal reasoning section and you have this new you know uh, section introduced which is the data insight section but do you see any question that you have already seen in the current version appearing here can you type it into the chat for me within the data insight section what is it that you see which is already there in the current version any question types the integrated reasoning you mean uh, yeah i had yes i did so you see integrated reasoning questions there you have this multi source reasoning table analysis graphics interpretation two part analysis but is that it is there any other question coming in here as well do you have any additional question hmm i like i wish i could say that it's just a shuffle but yeah data sufficiency right okay you were saying data sufficiency right so you have data combination of data sufficiency and integrated reasoning my bad for everybody who actually said ds earlier um real traditional i still use a full form but you can see that the problem solving is the question type that you have there but something is missing from the verbal reasoning while well, you know you have certain things added into the data insights one major section is missing and one major question type from the verbal reasoning is missing sentence correction i bet you missed the sentence correction um so and and which section is no yeah. longer there like, i i think it's your favorite section i i, I bet everybody i think you miss sc more as a teacher than as a student <laughs> right and, and probably the essay i think uh, as a student everybody is going to miss the essay isn't it right yes, guys absolutely <laughs> I, I'm sure that everybody is pretty, you know, pretty much crying about how they probably want to have the essay back. <laughs> but yeah, jokes apart, um, I know how much most of the people actually detest essays. But actually, while it was there, it was a fun section as well. But then, yeah, you don't have writing anymore. 
So did we just, you know, chop down questions and reshuffle questions, as you say? Um, or was there a lot more th thought process that has actually gone into it? So I mentioned that, you know, with the evolving uh, time, there was a need to make the test shorter. So as you can see, you have 64 questions to be answered in two hours and 15 minutes. And your score range of 202805, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that later. But it's not just the chopping off of questions to be, to be uh, clear. When the idea of actually coming up with a shorter test came into the picture, the idea was also to make sure that the test remains as rigorous and as relevant for business schools. I mean, one of the amazing things that GMAT has always done is make sure that it tests the right kind of skills that will not just uh, help you just, you know, as an assessment, get you into a business uh, school, but make sure you perform well in the business education. And after succeeding there, get an entry into a really good job into your uh, career as well or the kind of job that you want to get into. So preparing for the GMAT always has ensured this and we need to make sure that it continues to ensure that. So what are some of the skills that are really essential for succeeding in a business environment? So are there any specific skills that you do need when you get into a career in management? Type it in, okay, analytics, sure, problem solving, time management, logical thinking, all of you are completely right. Data interpretation, data crunching, critical thinking, yes, all of you are absolutely right. So these are the most relevant skills that are essential. So we did not randomly, so if we have to focus on certain question sets or make the test shorter, we have to hyper-focus on skills that are the most relevant for a management education and thereafter. So all of these skills are what has been focused on in the focus edition, uh, which means that the slightly less relevant content areas like the sentence correction, which lean a little bit more towards language than probably a critical reasoning or higher order reasoning. Um, also, in terms of question types, you'll find that the geometry bit of the entire quantitative aspect or, you know, wherever it's used in data sufficiency, all of that has been completely removed. Again, at some point when a business school felt it was relevant, that was introduced. But now, you know, keeping in mind which, is the, which are the most relevant skills, that is why that, you know, these specific skills or these specific alignments have actually brought into the picture. So a lot of you may be wondering, like, you know, uh, how exactly is the data insight section different from the integrated reasoning section. So the integrated reasoning section was also actually designed uh, to measure your, uh, your analytic abilities, right? Your ability to process information from multiple sources or data from multiple sources and make meaningful decisions. Uh, what data insight does is it brings together data sufficiency and um, the, the integrated reasoning questions both of which actually rely a bit on logic and with the right balance of quantitative and logical skills into a updated digital data literacy dimension. That is your ability to use data to make meaningful business decisions. That's the end goal. And I think you would all agree with me, uh, the way the world is actually moving forward. At every stage, it's really essential. I mean, even the people in the highest management have always used data to make critical decisions. Um, and it's more so with the way we are actually moving forward. And being data literate is like really important in your career also once you do your management education, right? Now, I talked to you about some of the features that make your testing experience really easy and uh, that make it shorter, efficient, and flexible, right? So let's try to take a look at each one of this. The first one is the question review and edit feature. So when you you have your three sections, right? Within a section, you have like 45 minutes. Let's say you're doing a verbal reasoning section. As you move through the section, um, you know, the test is still question adaptive. Let me be very clear with that. Uh, only after you answer one question can you move on to the next question. So the adaptive nature does not change. But once you finish a section and you reach the end of the section, um, if you have about two to three minutes remaining, then you will be able to, you know, you'll go to the review page. Now, before you go to the review page, it's advised 
that you bookmark the questions that you are actually unsure about so that when you get to the review page and you see a numbered list of all of the questions, you can go back to the specific questions that you want to. But that does not mean that you can go back only to the bookmark questions. You can go back to any question you want. But honestly, it's best that you actually, you know, make good use of the time that you have to make meaningful decisions at that point to, you know, impact your score in some way, right? So, which is why bookmarking is really advised. But um, once you do, you know, go back to your questions, you can change up to three responses. So one of the points that I also want to make is, let's say you pick up one question and you change the responses thrice on that single question, you will lose your three responses limit. So make sure you are using it in three separate questions and not on the same question itself. All right. The next one is the selecting of the section order. So in the current version of the GMAT exam, you can um, select about three specified orders. You either start with quant or you either start with verbal or you have the opportunity to start in the traditional way of the essay and the integrated reasoning and the remaining sections. So with the focus edition, you will have six combinations to work with. That means, uh, you know, the first section, the second section and the third section is entirely up to you as to how you want that order to be. Uh, a very important aspect is in the current version, you have two optional breaks that you can take up. In the new version, there will be one 10 minute break that you can take either after the first section or after the second section, right? The next one is improved score report. So this is one of my personal favorite as well, um, which is uh, currently in the official score report that you get with the registration. You don't get enhanced performance insights, right? But what you do have is you can purchase uh, for an additional $30, you can purchase the enhanced score report which gives you all of the detailed performance insights of your exam. Now, what is going to happen with the focus edition is all of these performance insights and more will be included within the official score report at no additional cost. So that means you'll be able to um, assess your performance across section. Like for instance, you'll be able to see your percentile ranking in terms of the total score, your section score, which is already there. But in addition to that, let's say you send your score report to a particular school or program, you will be able to see the percentile ranking of uh, candidates who have sent their score reports to the same program, uh, basis past five years of data. And this really helps you understand how you stack up against the competition or the other candidates who, who send, your, send their reports to the particular school. Um, the one more additional aspect here is also that, you know, there's there's uh, a lot of detailed insights with respect to the content domain, question types, your fundamental skills, time management, the amount of time you spent uh, per question, which really helps you with the pacing. And of course, your question review and edit, which tells you, you know, how much time did you actually spend on the review feature? Did it really impact your performance uh, and so on? So a lot more to come within the official score report, as I said. And lastly, and I think this is going to be equally exciting, which is the easier score sending. Now, with the current online version of the exam, there are a lot of benefits that come with uh, the, the online version, uh, especially with respect to the score sending. So with the online exam, after you have written the exam and uh, within 48, of, 48 hours of you having received the official score report on MBA.com, you can decide to actually send the scores during that 48 hours. Like you can contemplate, you can decide what works for you and then send those five free score reports that you get during that period. Whereas in the test center version, you have to select those five programs that you get free of cost before you even write the exam and after the exam you have an option of cancelling the scores right normally this does add a lot of pressure but uh, with the new focus edition the test center is going to mimic the online version and you have that period of 48 hours after you receive the official score report to send it so which means that you will no longer have to go through the grueling aspect of cancelling the scores like no cancellation no reinstating uh, which also means that when you send your score report to the business schools from the test center, 
they are not going to get your historical score report. You'll also be able to select the particular score that you want them to see and then send only that or uh, the appointment uh, or the score from the appointment that you want them to see, right? So again, extended from the online version of the exam. So great benefits coming your way. Um, now, in you know, let's let's pause for a moment and see exactly what's changing and not changing. And here's where I would like to address a few questions that I get asked quite a lot. Uh, what's going to happen with the acceptance of the GMAT exam? And let me reassure you that all the numbers that I spoke about, the 7,700 programs, and if not more, are going to continue accepting the GMAT. Uh, nothing is, you know, I've already mentioned that we are the nonprofit organization comprised of business schools. So, you know, every school clearly knows exactly what's going on with the GMAT and, you know, how we are moving forward. And it's with their buy-in that these changes have been made as well. They have been a part of this entire process of uh, changing the exam. Now, in terms of uh, delivery method, the online and test center is available as is. The, the administration or operation part does not change. Structure we've talked about, test design, I've already mentioned this question adapter. I'm going to skip, skip a couple of these and go directly to the attempts. Um, you still have only eight attempt lifetime limit, um, which means that this is applied across both the versions of the exam. So if you've taken the GMAT once, and if you, you know, the remaining attempts for the focus would actually be another six, uh, sorry, seven attempts, right? Uh, also within a rolling calendar 12 month period, you will be able to take the exam five times with the 16 day appointment gap. Um, so that still remains the same. Accommodations is if you have, you're somebody with special needs and if you need additional help, you can with the, you know, specific documents, avail all of the benefits, extra break time and any other resources that are actually required. The fees remain at par with the current version of the GMAT. But I think you realize that you do get a lot more benefits with the focus edition with the fees. For instance, your score report um, is including something that was, you know, uh, costing $35, $30 earlier. So the benefits are definitely, uh, you know, you gain a bit more in the focus in terms of all of these aspects. Now, I've already addressed the registration bit, but one thing I do want to suggest is if you are looking to write the exam and if you are applying for the round one, please do ensure that you register for the exam as soon as possible. You might take the exam later, but get your test registrations done because we are in a peak period and with all of these changes, a lot of people are, you know, it's it's the numbers have gone up really high. We have a lot of candidates taking the exam. So if you want your choice location and uh, if you want the right time of day that you know you you would like, Make sure you're booking well in advance. I'd probably suggest maybe like two months in advance or two to three months in advance if that's possible. So make sure you do that, right? Uh, ID requirements, there's no change. Uh, you will be using Passport for the test center and for online, you can use the Passport or other card. But ideally, try to get your Passport done so that you know you can have that as a choice backup option even if you did give your other card. Now, let's address the... Uh, the changes in the score scaling and how is it going to change for the focus edition? So I've already mentioned this. the The total score is a you know of the GMAT exam focus edition is going to be a combination of the three sections, which is the verbal reasoning, quantitative reasoning, and data insights, which is a bit different from what exists currently, which is a combination of verbal reasoning, quantitative reasoning score. The score ranges from 205 to 805 in increments of 10 and uh, the total score range and the section score ranges from 60 to 90 in increments of 1. Um, so again, if you know, you're thinking like, uh, do the schools know about this change? Um, you know, why do we, you know, what's the point of having actually changed, having this difference in the score range from the current version? First of all, uh, obviously uh, having a different score scale helps understand, uh, or, you know, the range helps both the schools as, as well as you distinguish between both the versions of the exam. But it is not just a matter of why, uh, because uh, you will see, you know, all of the features that we've discussed previously, all of the uh, structural changes that we have discussed previously does not really allow you to com compare both the scores 
uh, with each other, directly with each other at least. This is where percentile rankings come into the picture. And if you are wondering if the schools are aware about this kind of score scaling and, you know, if uh, they're, uh, you know, they know how to look at the percentile ranking, absolutely, yes, they do. As I've mentioned, we have worked very closely with the schools uh, for both the focus edition features as well as the score range, right? So as I've mentioned, you can't directly compare the, oh, let's see one second, yeah. You can't directly compare the score range from uh, the current version and the new version. So you might be asking the question, so how do we exactly do that? As I've mentioned, score, your score can be compared using percentile ranking, which is um, if your percentile ranking is at 75, that means you have performed better than 75% of the test takers like during that period, right? And if you want to understand how this works, you can actually look at the concordance table. Um, you can see that uh, if the school is going to look at somebody with, uh, uh, you know, a 90th percentile and above, they, in right now, they would look at somebody above 700 score. Whereas with the focus edition, they would be looking at somebody who's got us mid 600s or who has a score in the mid 600s. So please make sure that you do not randomly compare the scores from the current version or, and the new version. The schools are on board. All of these concordance tables are available on the mba.com. So please do make sure that you go there and explore this further to get a better understanding. All right. Um, so before I kind of like wind up, uh, so we've already kind of launched the focus edition, all of the test prep, uh, the official prep. Uh, you will find uh, the materials available on the mba.com slash exam prep. You can go there and access both the current version as well as the new version. Uh, you have a six-week study guide. You have both the practice exams one and two. You have the free official starter kit with, with about 70 questions that are retired from the current, like the existing and the new version of the GMAT uh, or the ones that are developed for it. So besides this, you have access to the purchased material, you know, material for purchase, which is the um, the test three and four, and then five and six. Then you also have the official guide bundle, which consists of your uh, the official guide, your quantitative review, verbal review, and the data insights review. In addition to all of this, you have the uh, question banks of hundred plus questions each, which you can actually practice and get a sense of the you know new version also. So if you are somebody uh, who's looking to kind of like uh, buy these prep materials, we do have an exclu exclusive prep discount for the focus edition. You can use prep 10 to avail this offer. Um, it will be available till the end of October. So you can actually, you know, keep that in mind. Um, before I get to the timelines, I just want to address one more aspect about the prep. If you're somebody who's, you know, already taking the GMAT exam and uh, you you feel like, you know, you probably want to take the focus edition later, the, the idea is take a practice exam for the focus. I'm sure that you realize that the question types in itself, there are not a lot of differences. It's pretty much the same, except the, the let's say, when you look at the data insights and when you look at data sufficiency questions, the, the number of questions that will lean towards a, you know, a font side versus a verbal side, that would be in the right mix rather than, you know, taking the entire thing out. So take a practice exam and see how you're able to adapt to the new format of the exam, whether you're comfortable with it, or, and if you actually need more practice moving forward from there. And that would really help you gauge how much more preparation that you would need moving forward for the focus. So point is that with the current preparation, you should still be easily able to adapt to the new version. You shouldn't face any challenges in doing so, right? Now, the most important thing, which is the timeline. Uh, so the, the focus edition is all set to um, register or open registrations on August 29th. And its testing will begin in quarter four. We have not specified the date set, but we are releasing the communication soon. Uh, when I say quarter four, I technically mean October, November, and December. Then the current version of the exam will cease to exist 
exist in early quarter one. That means like Jan, Feb sometime, you probably see the sunset of the current version of the GMAT exam. Now, one important thing is, will the score for, for the current version of the GMAT still be valid? 100% yes. Your five-year validity period for the GMAT exam is true for the current version as well as the GMAT exam, okay? And how the school school's going to look at both the exams, as I said, using the percentile rankings and not going to compare the direct scores at all. So with that, I've come to the end of my deck and I would like to open the floor for questions. Great. So first of all, thank you, Seema, for such an informative session. I think this was beneficial to all of our attendees. So guys, um, please do fire away. Um, we are all here to ask questions. And once you guys have asked your questions, then I'll chip in with a couple of questions from my side as well, in case those yeah. questions haven't been asked. Cool. So you can either uh, speak on the mic or just type in the chat box. <clears throat> Uh, hi, good evening. Good evening, Seema. Good evening, Param, sir. Good evening. Good evening, okay. good evening. Uh, Thank you for sharing your insights on this. This has been really helpful. Uh, whereas I sure. have a few questions and probably the first one would be that why is there a difference? You had shown the table that uh, the GMAT, uh, GMAT focus edition, uh, the total over there, 755 equals to 800 of the GMAT, the regular mm. GMAT. So why is this, this kind of difference in the scoring? So if you look at uh, the focus edition. What are the new? What is the major? Let's start with the structure. Uh, is there the same number of uh, sections that were there in the current version? No, no. The the section. But there's one less section. Yeah, one less section. But there is a uh, you know regrouping or a recalibration and uh, what do you call it? The, the algorithm wise, the way it actually functions, that has changed a bit. I mean, the question adaptiveness is still there. But there's a you know, few updated calibration, especially in terms of the data insight section as well. If you look at the current version, there were only two sections contributing to the score as well. Right. Isn't it? Right. Now right. you have three sections contributing to the total score also. Plus, the features that are added, you have uh, the you know, section order wise or even the question review and edit feature wise. That's something that the you know what that's not there in the current version of the GMAT exam. Isn't so it? basically the things uh, that were included in the indicated reasoning, they are also going to be scored now. Yes. They're going to be marked. It okay. Is. So there is a so which is why it doesn't make sense. I mean it's it's not an apple to apple comparison, isn't it? It's completely like that there is a very clear differentiated uh, uh, structure in terms of both the current version and the GMAT. I it's kind of testing the similar skills. Uh, the way it has been calibrated has changed considerably, which is why it's not fair to actually com directly compare both the scores. Right, right. I get it now. Right. Right. Also, so again, uh, I do understand the difference in the scoring pattern and mm -hmm. the difference what all the pattern of the exam. Whereas uh, for someone like me who has been preparing for the the traditional, the regular GMAT uh, yeah. exam for the mm -hmm. past three to four months, and I've already booked my exam for the month of September. Sure. Uh, so, do you still recommend that uh, we should give an attempt to the GMAT Focus Edition uh, in case? Uh... I, I, I don't. I would never force anybody to take the focus unless and until it's required. Uh, so, I've I've taught the current version of the GMAT in the past as well. So, you know, both. There's no difficulty level difference in either of them because I've, I've, I know that this question has been asked quite a bit, uh, but each in its own right in terms of the exams. What really matters is when is your uh, timeline? Like, well, how does your timeline work? Because if you are looking to apply for round one, which is essentially like September in most of the schools, then it doesn't make sense for you to wait because you need to get it out of the way immediately. And as I've mentioned, getting the test and the slots right now is is a challenge, which we are working very hard to make sure that, you know, there are more test dates coming up as well. Um, test slots rather. But you, you need to work on a lot of other things if that is the case, right? If you're going to continue with your application cycle for the 2024. So I'd strongly suggest kind of like stick with that and complete your exam. I'm sure you will do great. Um, if you want to, at least at some point in time, you can consider taking the GMAT focus as well, you know, 
but yeah you'll probably be the uh, few people who might who have access to both the versions of the exam right now because once it sunsets in the current version sunsets in uh, quarter one you wouldn't have an option of taking the current version again so yeah i mean it, it really depends a lot on your timeline yeah, so probably R1, you're definitely looking at the current version. Yeah, yeah. R2, um, ISP R2 is roughly December. So that might be about the time that the GMAT focus comes out. So Q4. Correct. I mean, if you're looking at round two, yeah, probably uh, you can consider. But it's a bit, uh, yeah. the reason why I suggest for round one and round two is only because it's just such a tight, tight timeline, you know. Uh, because you do have to give yourself that mm -hmm. space for getting everything else ready as okay. well. So, so right, you know, and again, uh, sorry, so please go on. Yes. Yeah, so, just one particular question: Is there any reason why GMSC has made it Q four instead of maybe giving an exact date? Because I think that's where right. a lot of the confusion is. Because Q four is three months. And in those three months, you also have ISP R2. So that's sort so of... So we will be, you know, as I said, we will specify the date soon. One of the things mm -hmm. that we are very particular about is making sure that the experience is pretty seamless. Mm -hmm. And this has always been the timeline that we have worked on. Um, so nothing, it's, you know, I think by now, anybody who actually knows us would understand that we work on very strict timelines and... Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's it's really important to make sure that the test is very fair and unbiased and uh, the the security measures and everything is, you know, pretty much extremely okay. well in place before it, it's actually released. So that's, that's one of the reasons why we had, you know, from the release to the launch, probably we have such a expansive timeline. Indeed, indeed. So probably away, R1 definitely it's the current version, R2 yeah, yeah, most yeah, probably yeah. the current version. Yes, sir. So, but if even if it's R2, but someone for someone like me who's enjoying doing sentence sentence correction, so probably the older GMAT version is the one that I should go for because that's probably I think the strongest out of the three for me. Hmm. So, hmm. I think yeah, I mean, uh, probably we can. I mean, that's what I said. It's it's a lot about the subjectivity about you know what really works for you mm -hmm. than anything else. I mean, if that's something that you are used to, then I think you should definitely go for that. It's going to be valid right. for five years. The validity is not affected in any way. I got it. Thank you. Thank you so much. No problem. Brilliant. So I think Lisha uh, raised her hand first. So And then we will get to Devam's and Parth's question as well. So Lisha, you had a question. Yeah. So uh, hi, Seema. First of all, thank you for clarifying most of our doubts in the deck itself. Uh, I like it was really helpful. Uh, so I had one uh, common question that all of us have. Uh, until which date will the current version be available? And I'll then move on to the next question. So you're looking at ideally uh, quarter one, as I said, for the 2024. So you see, I know that we have not specified the dates, but as I said, you know, again, I can't tell you when we are going to specify the dates, but we are going to do that pretty soon. Um, so you'll have a very clear picture uh, in some time. But you're looking at like maybe Jan, Feb of uh, the period of like uh, next year where, you know, the current version will actually stop uh, being there. And only the focus edition will continue to be the new GMAT, right? So you don't have focus edition and current version anymore. And then you just have the GMAT exam. But you're ideally looking at some time in Jan, Feb of understood. 2024. Understood. Uh, so uh, understood that. Uh, next question would be, will this impact the level of questions? Say we are having a different grading uh, or percentile for the say, for the marking in both the editions, right? But will a 700 level question in the current GMAT be different than a 600 level question in the focus edition? How will that uh, behave? Okay, so I don't get what you mean by 700 level and 600 level because it's always the quest, the whole test actually adapts to your performance uh, in the sense uh, when you actually move through the questions. So you mean to say that like, as you move through the questions yeah. getting more yeah. difficult? Yeah. Uh, but on that basis, what exactly do you mean? Like you just uh, rephrase your question so that I can understand it better. Uh, so, in simpler terms, will the level of questions get tougher? Will the level of questions remain the same? Or no, it's going to do function the same way as it is doing right now. Okay. Okay. Uh, because uh, even even if you look at the current version of the GMAT exam, 
it's it's never been tougher or easier for anybody it's always been very adaptive for each person like in the sense how you handle the question it you know the next question is given to you according to that isn't it so that remains exactly the same so that that's not going to affect you uh understood uh, so the reason why i asked this question is because uh, we'll have lesser number of questions in the focus edition right mm -hmm. so we will have less room to make mistakes or how do we uh ensure it's that we calibrated so it, it doesn't really work like that i mean it's definitely mm -hmm. recalibrated to you know perform the same adaptation uh i, I unfortunately i uh, you know I, i'm not a psychometrician so i can't give you such a detailed aspect but and what i would really advise you is to you know even i did this when i used to teach candidates at one point in time is not to get into this nitty gritty details of how the exam is actually conducted rather kind of like just focus on the questions itself and dealing with them uh you'd find that a lot of this undue pressure comes on to you when you start thinking about this you know uh you uh, it's like uh, for example let me just tell you this like um if if i'm writing the exam and i'm i got an easy question all right for the next question is like easy for me so my simple logical uh, you know reputation in that respect is it might have been easy for me what if it was harder for the rest of the uh, pool of test takers because sometimes you know what there are anomal anomalous situations where a wherein you know you find a certain type of question actually easy or something that might have been actually hard you went through it faster and you were able to do it deal with it faster but at the moment you know and i know plenty of people like the moment they get a easy question like oh my god i've messed up all of the first few questions and then the remaining question it, there's no point doing the entire exam whereas you know when the scores you know uh, came uh, they re saw the scores at the end of it they performed really well um so which is why i always tell you not to actually uh, look at this aspect yes the scores have the the algorithm has been recalibrated it has been normalized um uh, for you know based on the past data but it you know whether you get the second question easy or hard or you know whether it's more it, it's not it's never going to be like uh, oh this is the uh, easy you know this this has been shortened so let's make it make all the questions harder it doesn't work like that it is normalized according to the entire test taker data like during that period all of the people who are taking that test and including yourself is normalized to that you know okay. so that's how it actually works got it so i think if i could just follow up on lisha's point i think um, maybe some of where that is coming from is possibly some speculation on gmat club right um because in the quant section there are going to be a lot more percentiles as compared to the current version of the gmat so there is a general belief that possibly the quant section itself maybe not the entire paper just the quant section specifically might be a bit tougher to just distinguish no not at all i mean i, I can very safely say that the the it doesn't function like that at all mm -hmm. absolutely not brilliant no, but it is needed to this uh i'll be very honest over i haven't given as much time to ir as i've given to quant and verbal but i think for this edition we'll have to practice ir equally because that's again mark mm -hmm. right so we'll have to so integrated reasoning is actually a very fun section to build let me just tell you one thing i used to, i used to teach verbal and in fact very oddly i have one of my very old 2016 students still here vijay hi uh, <laughs> so um I so i i used to find uh, i used to call myself a quant retard um because i used to like literally hate math but you know having moved forward from there and uh, i've i've i actually taught integrated reasoning questions as well while i used to teach the gman um that goes a you know long way <laughs> i mean that that goes a, a long way to say you know see that it's not about quant quant as per se it's purely logical and you will find that it's actually fun uh, integrated reasoning if you actually let's say the verbal bit of it if you dealt with your critical reasoning you'll find that it is just about the application in fact it's easier it's easier than that um even if you look at the uh, you know quant it's it doesn't involve i just you know heavy statistical mm -hmm. mathematics or anything of the sort basic stuff there in terms of you look at the information and um you know identify like come to, come to certain decision making and it's it's not even as complicated as uh, you know as uh, param had earlier mentioned how the how does it differ it's not as complicated as the data interpretation on cat it, it's quite reasonable and just uh, brings you back to the logic indeed
Cool. So, Abhay, I hope that answers your question. Yes, definitely. Thank you. All right. You're welcome. So now I think Devam, Shagun, Parth, all of them had similar questions almost. So Devam and Shagun asked, will Indian B-schools like ISP accept the GMAT focus? And Parth asked, Indian B-schools like the IMs, one-year program, would they accept the GMAT focus? And in the same vein, Brushal also had a question, similar question. Um, how do you see the focus version uh, panning out as far as acceptance by business schools is concerned? Um, as HBS has already decided, they will like to watch out for a year. Do you see the same happening for other business schools? So I'd also like to mention that if you read the whole thing, you would find that HBS is accepting for the focus edition for two plus two program <laughs> in the same breath. So it's only for the uh, the twenty twenty four cycle also to remove the confusion from students' mm -hmm. minds that SBS has mentioned that but as I said you know uh, in the third line or fourth line you'll find them having mentioned that uh, the focus edition is accepted for the deferred MBA or the two plus two program right um so yeah we we work collaboratively with all of the business schools I've met the ISB team as well so they will continue to accept the focus edition as soon as it is uh, you know launched so there's not going to be any uh, what do you call bias or anything of that sort. As I said, you know, all of the changes that have happened in the focus is with the business schools. They have been a part of the research. They have been a part of this change. So when you say that, will they accept it? They are the, you know, they're the ones who wanted this change and they are the ones who've been a part of uh, this whole change as well. So if they don't, then that would be funny, isn't it? <laughs> So, yeah, no, they're, they're definitely, everybody is uh, accepting the focus as soon as it moves on to the newer version. So, some of the communication you'll see mostly because there has been a lot of confusion with respect to the 2024 cycle. And uh, they just want to make sure that the students are not confused by it or, you know, they, they just make the decision faster and then just finish it off. Because uh, yeah. keeping it to the last moment really affects their timelines as well as your timelines. So, that's yeah. why that communication is out there. Okay, so I think that helps, definitely. So guys, does that answer the question? Devam, Shagun, Rishal. Uh, right, Josh, to add to that, uh, uh, how much time approximately will it take for the percentiles to stabilize? So whatever percentiles you see here, it is actually done, you know, based on simulations and on the past data and everything for more than... And, and there has been... Uh, more than 5,400 testers in the, you know, testing version, like in the sense we have run research over that many candidates who actually use this calibration in the first place. Um, so it is, it is pretty much stable already. So I, I doubt that, you know, uh, so due diligence and work has gone into it to make sure that the data is accurate in terms of the percentile as well. So I, I doubt that you're going to see any major differences, uh, where, you know, anytime soon. Understood. Thank you. You're welcome. Great. Right. So then I think Shantanu had a question. So in terms of yeah. topics, he says, um, I understand SC and geometry are no longer part of the test scope. Are there any other topics which will no longer be part of the focus edition or is it just SC and geometry? And AWA, of course. And right? AWA. Yeah, that's just about it. And I think uh, in, when I mentioned that integrated reasoning, right, uh, one of the things uh, I, I want everybody to, you know, feel rest assured is there's going to be a right mix of, uh, you know, verbal questions and uh, like the, the kind of quantitative questions, not even quantitative reasoning, they're, they're data questions, but uh, there are some that lean a bit more. If you've seen the questions, you'll understand that there are some that lean a little bit towards, uh, you know, involving a little math and the other one involving more verbal. So there's always going to be a balance in all of those question types. It's not going to be everybody's given, thrown at, you know, uh, a lot of quantitative questions. So that's something that, you know, internally and externally, a psychometrician has also addressed and mentioned. And as you move forward, that, that mix will become very clear as well in terms of how many questions or what percentage of questions and all. So, yeah. Great. Great. Thank you, Seema. Um, Shantanu, hopefully that addresses the question. Yes, thank you. Brilliant.
So then Pranav had a pretty interesting one and Prasenjit will get to your question later. And that sort of overlaps also with my question. Um, so Pranav says he wanted to ask about the weightage of each section. Um, so as you mentioned, Seema, earlier in the presentation that currently two sections are weighted equally on the GM yeah. and mm -hmm. now it be three sections. Um, yeah. But really the weightage is not quite equal, right? Because verbal always contributes a bit more to the composite. For example, if someone gets, let's say, a P44, which mm -hmm. is the 98th percentile, and even a Q47, which is 59th percentile, he or she can still score a 730, which is a 96th percentile composite. Yeah, right. The reverse will never work, right? I mean, if someone gets a Q51 and a P30 equivalent to a Q47. Because the score scales are different, yes. Yeah. Exactly. So it won't ever give you that much. So as far as the focus addition is concerned, will it really be truly equal among the three sections or will it be verbal mode, quant mode, DI mode? Is there any Again, sort of... That's, that's like... something that I probably won't be able to give mm -hmm. you an answer to right now. Yeah. But the moment I have more information mm -hmm. about that or I can go back to the team and then... But as far as I know, or like the communication that I have as well as that they're going to contribute equally to each... Uh, each hmm. of those are going to contribute equally, right? But in terms of the uh, percentile ranking, obviously, I mean, you have to look at a percentile ranking in, in terms of comparing the score scales because hmm. uh, both of them are not by score comparable. The contribution is very different when I talk about it, you know, because uh, on the surface, you have one level of like, okay, uh, 60 to 90 going on. Then you have mm -hmm. the, what do you call, the different score scaling that goes on. A lot of processing there for it to actually come to this particular decision. Like certain skill sets which are actually measured. Uh, I'm not just talking about critical thinking and, you know, reasoning skills, but also mm -hmm. cognitive skills in terms of even, you know, so that it, the in terms of diversity, inclusivity and everything, uh, each each question before it actually makes its way into the GMAT exam, it goes through a 12-month process, just mm -hmm. to put it out there. So a lot of these aspects are taken into consideration to come to that total score. So Brilliant. So I think, yeah, I mean, would be great to get some more clarity. And I suppose we can always follow up on this key, you know, what the exact contribution will be. But right. I think um, from what the official communication is, that all three sections uh, will be weighted equally. Right. So Prasenjit says, presently ESR is not available for the GMAT online, but it will be the same for GMAT Focus. So I think on GMAT Focus, you get the similar to ESR immediately after finishing the exam, right? Yeah. So that will be for free at no additional cost. Correct, correct. Just because a score report uh, inherently contains all of these mm. performance insights. Correct. So you don't need an extra ESR after that, uh, if that makes sense. Perfect. Then Shagun says, Hi Seema, I have a follow-up question with regard to the availability date of the current version. Will the last date to write the exam be in Jan or Feb? Yeah, yeah. Will the last date to book be in Take Jan? the exam. Take the exam. Great. Yep. So that's pretty much the last date to take yeah, exam. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Because you can't book in Jan, Feb, and then because like you, you, you won't get the test dates and everything. And it's like... Correct, because it's already in sunset. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Brilliant. So then Prasenjit had another question with regard to Indian B schools. Specifically, I'm MW. Uh -huh. So we're just talking about one school, which does not accept the online GMAT score for the executive program. Mm -hmm. With GMAT focus, will this issue be resolved? So I think it's more of an individual school's call. And that I, I wouldn't say it's an issue. I think it was, uh, it, it was more from a, a precautionary mm -hmm. fact considering that, you know, uh, a great privilege was introduced into the system, mm -hmm. uh, into the country in terms of uh, the flexibility in the COVID time, for it, it was grossly misused at that particular mm -hmm. point. Of course, as GMAT, we have taken very strong measures and maintained the integrity, but we've had other assessments also do the same thing. And it's a common, uh, you know, they can't take a decision for one and not take a decision for the other, if mm -hmm. I may speak very candidly. Um, so, <laughs> So, which is why uh, that online for GMAT also were, you know, uh, was not, uh, you know, they decided to actually not look at that and just look at the test center to maintain the integrity. So, that's mm -hmm. something that they've taken as a collective decision for any assessment and not just the GMAT. 
and i think it's an individual school call um probably i mean our school teams or like our team always try to make you know make sure that uh, we bring it back up but yeah that's it is what it is so true and i think there were rackets also that were uncovered in mumbai and some other parts yeah, yeah. that breach kind of contribute uh, in our case at least we shut them down are pretty fast and pretty strongly mm. so correct 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 so yeah i mean it's on a school by school basis but i think gmat focus will be available in centers so i don't think they would yes, have yes of course and i think i strongly encourage everybody to actually take it at the center the experience is really good as well i mean which of works most schools accept the online exam for it yeah correct correct then prasanjit hopefully that clarifies the query So Brita had a question. Will IR follow the same score pattern in focus? So not in, of course, scale of one on eight, one through eight, but sixty through ninety, and then DS is also part of that. But the main question is, if you answer part of the question incorrectly, do you lose out on your score on the entire question? I think that would still be the case. Yeah, I mean those aspects do not change. This question adaptive. You're not. There's no negative marking. adaptiveness is very interesting actually i mean see all of the information regarding the adaptiveness is actually if you're really interested in that it's there on the website like mg.com or gmac website as well but generally you know what i always tell um, students or the candidates who are taking the exam to not really get deep into this aspect because the more you try to find something and i think uh, gmat is notorious or like you know people think it's difficult mainly because uh the amount of work that has gone behind the exam is so much and if you try, try to deep dive into it you will be like thinking oh it's complicated actually the exam itself is not complicated uh when you start looking at the deeper aspects then you end up thinking that but it's just like any other assessments you take the a, n number of questions you answer it right you get the marks that's it you know so it works in pretty much the same same way so the end goal is to get all of the answers right i mean that's just about it true um, so So no part. So, it's either correct or incorrect. <laughs> yeah, it's either a correct or an incorrect uh, answer. Indeed. Cool. So Pranav had an interesting question. Okay, what's the rationale on the changes in the number of questions and the time duration? For example, verbal drop from thirty six through twenty three, authoring question drop, but the time went down by twenty minutes. That's correct. Mm -hmm. even though essay questions are usually wrapped up in a much shorter amount of time minute minute 20 maybe and cr and rc take a lot more usually so the rational i suppose in terms of the number of question drop i guess to be honest i mean i'm probably not the right person to answer this question either the product team has worked intensely on determining exactly how many questions and everything um uh, yeah i'm i'm the facilitator of that information rather than I was saying, yeah. um, so I probably not be in a position to answer. You know, why did they decide like X number of questions, or you know, um, very very specific uh, in terms of exactly why these number? Not not really sure either. Um, probably that's something I can ask the product team and then just tell sure. you, yeah, this is this is why it is. Um, sure. but yeah, one one thing I'd like to probably add here is that uh, for time per question is still good. You will have about. Two minutes to answer each question, like as it was earlier. Um, so that's quite a lot of time. In fact, it, it does give you the room to have those two extra minutes to, you know, use the question review and edit feature. Um, so whatever has been done in terms of the number of questions, it 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 has made sure that uh, question per, I mean, time per question is sufficient. to answer those well so it could also be one of the things that you know has been taken into consideration but not definitely and and one thing i can say for sure is i know it's not just one aspect there are like a million things that has gone into the thought process of actually coming up with certain number of questions and time and range and everything so mm mm -hmm. well one thing which i will probably add and it might be slightly controversial i don't think it's quite the same because sc gets removed and sc usually takes a lot lower Yeah. So two minute per question would make sense because it's not really two minute per question on R C and C R. Mm. If you solve S C in a minute thirty, then actually that gives you two minute ten for C R and R C. So in a way, it might have might have again a slightly adversarial effect because usually a non-native test speaker 
usually would take a bit more time to, I suppose, read through the, you know, condensed passages of text. I honestly, uh, so Asi has always been one of my favorites. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it really depends because the way, you know, uh, candidates generally think about RC has a lot to do with that mindset that comes in like I have to read the entire mm -hmm. uh, obviously mm -hmm. like, reading the entire thing is important but you know the memorizing and getting stuck there and reading it again and again that sort of thing but mm -hmm. you know with the right kind of balance is more about like once they read it properly and then they go through the questions they find it really easy to kind of like go through the remaining questions much faster because they know where to locate each response so mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I guess that has a lot to do with the uh, which question, probably the first question where the RC appears is where they would have to end up spending a little extra time. But the remaining mm -hmm. questions can go a little less over one minute also if they know exactly where to look for the response. This is, this is like from my past. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, okay. I, I kind of like think it's just about how, how to actually uh, manage the pacing and the understanding of the question type as far as the candidate is concerned. So... True, and I suppose in the, I guess, in a few months since the GMAT Focus releases, we'll find out how yeah, yeah. it's a score. Sure. So my personal belief is that because SC is there, it sort of um, makes the RC a bit more feasible. But if SC goes away, then the time pressure will always be a bit Yeah, yeah. But, yeah, like but time will Yeah, in my training background and probably being a part of this thing, I actually think both critical reasoning and uh, RC mm -hmm. are still... I used to find RC pretty easy. I think Vijay would <laughs> I agree with you. I used to find it like super easy. And hmm. yeah. Well, you're in the very small minority of us. <laughs> generally, we uh, But generally, people picked up RC quite fast. So mm. yeah. 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 Cool. So, any other questions? I think Santosh, you had a question. Um. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Hi, 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 Param, sir. Uh, hi, ma'am. So, hi. Uh, yeah, uh, ma'am, you mentioned that uh, GMAT allows us to uh, send five free scores to mm -hmm. free score report to uh, different schools. Mm -hmm. So, uh, like, uh, I am uh, currently a fresh graduate and I'm preparing for it. So, I don't have enough further experience to apply itself, like, in this year only. So, if I give the exam and so will they send my report for the uh, current rounds or further any yeah, year? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So your five free score reports, is, uh, it comes with the registration. And then as I said, even with the focus after you have, uh, you know, we, once your official score report comes, you have to give it within the, what do you call, specified, uh, what do you call, uh, 48 hours. So that that is uh, applicable during that period only. So that might not, but but then of course your five year validity period is there, but you might not be able to. If you're not applying immediately, you will not be able to make use of those those five three score reports. Oh, okay, okay, that would be thank you. No problem. Brilliant. Any other questions, anyone? <clears throat> I just one question. I just wanted to quickly ask. Uh, sure, sure. Out of the fact. Like, I'm just ending this. So, a simple thing, like, you know, on the testing side, whenever the testing gets starts in the Q4, will all the centers, you know, where the people can right now go and give the GMAT, will all the centers uh, be facilitating the new focus edition as well? Yes. Like, isn't there a case that some centers will say, no, we will allow the old GMAT paper? No, no as of now, that. that's not how it's planned. But yeah, I mean, if there's any such communication, I'll you know, I'll be the first person to tell you that. But yeah, as of now, now no. Uh, so while we are booking uh, a follow up on the same question, so while we are booking our tests, say in this overlap period where both the tests would be available, uh, we we'll, we have to check center by center and then choose whatever version we want. Or will the application be different? So the, that sort of communication, once it actually comes out, and then once I have it in place and I'm, I'm at the liberty to actually share it as well, I would be communicating that directly. So okay. you don't have to worry about it and how and what and exactly the process and everything. We will be sending it out to everybody. Okay. Great. 
Cool. So as of now, we can all assume that, you know, every test center, at least in India, would serve both versions of the test when the focus edition comes out. Yes. So I'm just dropping my email ID in here as well. If anybody wants to kind of like directly reach out and have more questions, I try to answer as many questions as, uh, you know, as soon as I can. In case I'm not responding, that's probably because I'm traveling or I'm like, it's really hectic for me. But uh, please do reach out and there's nothing that would make me happier than to kind of like clarify your doubts. Um, so I, I would be your point of connect in terms of like you hear anything else from anywhere else. And obviously Param is here to guide you as well. But yeah, so in, 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 in case you just want to kind of get back and get some piece of information, you can reach out. Brilliant. So I just had a very quick couple of queries, Seema. Um, so yeah. I don't think nobody asked sure anybody has asked it yet so i'll just have a quick stab at it so with specifically with regard to the response change i know it probably does not matter as much but just for my clarity mm -hmm. so you mentioned that there are only three response changes allowed yeah yeah um, right um so does a response change count when you actually change the response and hit the next button or when you just toggle between the radio buttons is that counted as a response change when you submit it when you actually when you take the entire it. thing into consideration yeah Got it. and finally the other last question was can you actually supercharge your score so you mentioned that you send your best score can no, no, no 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 from different versions no just the composite super scoring is not there got it perfect Cool. So I think everything else has been answered in terms of... Yeah, it's, it's been really in, in, interactive. I think this has been really fun. So Awesome. Awesome. So, all right. Thank you then. Um, so I think it was a very informative session from your side as well, Seema. So thank you for making the time out. On a yeah. Start. And I'd like to thank all the participants who come here as well on your Sunday evening. Um, and okay. thank Param for organizing this. Uh, it has definitely been intriguing and, you know, uh, I'd say the exam's not difficult. Uh, it's it's just about the way you actually handle it. I mean, don't take pressure with respect to the exam. Mm -hmm. If you are uh, looking at, uh, if you're not registered on MBA.com, please make sure you go there and register because you have a lot of free resources. I feel like many people just fail to actually avail all of those free resources. Mm -hmm. Just to ensure that when you are registering, you're entering your name as is, it is in the, on the ID proof that you will be you know, showcasing on the actual day of the exam eventually whenever you do take it. But uh, from free practice exams to quizzes to uh, like salary calculator to what not, there's like just a lot of uh, resources that you can actually make use of. So go ahead and do that and all the best. Absolutely. So the name point, just make sure, you know, even the middle name should match the name on your passport. Yeah, yeah. Since you have to send a mail to them to request for a name change. Exactly, exactly. Because I went through the process, I think one of my characters was misspelled on the idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, so, the, the, the testing it's integrity is like, they're really big on the testing integrity. Exactly. So that every aspect is like very carefully taken care of. So. so it's like booking an airline ticket. You know, if you misspell your name, then tough luck at the but security. Like awesome <laughs> cool. All right. So thank you everyone for tuning in and attending the session and making it so interactive for Seema. And thank you, Seema, for taking out so much of your time and right. our learners as well. So that's it from my side. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Seema. Um, and yeah, have a great rest of your Sunday, everyone. And if you have any questions, do reach out to either Seema or to me, and we will definitely get back to you. Okay. All the best with your studies and all the best with your prep. Good night, everyone.